Hello and welcome to Lard Island, the home of Two Fat Lardies. This is the next in a series of occasional broadcasts designed for YouTube that will allow us to demonstrate some of our rule systems and give you an idea of how they work on the tabletop. Today I'm joined by my old friend Nick and we're looking at one of our forthcoming rule sets due for publication this summer, Chain of Command. These rules are designed for what we call a platoon plus size game, where the basic force for each side is a platoon of infantry with one or two support units to assist them. So let's take a look at a typical British force. So here we have a standard late war British platoon. It's got three sections of 10 men, a two inch mortar team and a pit team, and is commanded by a lieutenant and a platoon sergeant. Each section is commanded by a corporal and is made up of two teams, the Bren team and the rifle team. Whether they fight as individual teams or a whole section is entirely up to the player. How many men are in the Bren team, how many men make up the rifle team is again a decision a player can make based on the situation or scenario. And during the game, if the Bren team is running short of men, it can be reinforced by men from the rifle team. Uh, this flexibility means that special forces such as uh, the Special Air Service, Long Range Desert Group or Brandenburg Commandos can be organised however the player wishes when undertaking specific missions. Chain of Command uses a pre-game phase to determine just what intelligence both sides have about the other's general location before the game begins. This patrol phase, as we call it, represents information gathered by patrols or troops in the area prior to the mission beginning. This will determine where our troops will deploy once the game proper begins. Nick and I are going to demonstrate how that works. Here's the table that Nick and I are going to be fighting over today. How this phase of the game is played will depend on the scenario selected from the rulebook. Here we're taking a simple encounter battle with both sides advancing from a single entry point. In this game, the British will be advancing from here and the Germans from the road over here. Nick and I have dice for our force morale and with this scenario, and it does differ, as his morale is higher he'll get to go first. He now moves one of his four patrol markers 12 inches. He can go in any direction he wants but he must remain within 12 inches of at least one other patrol marker. Now I move one of mine then Nick gets to go again. We've got to both continue moving, uh, taking it in turns but we must keep all of our patrol markers in a continuous chain with each one being within 12 inches of another one in that chain as we advance across the table. Carry on in sequence until one of our patrol markers reaches a point 12 inches from an enemy marker. At that point both of these markers are locked down, in other words they cannot move again in the patrol phase. We keep moving the patrol markers until one side or the other has all of their markers locked down. At that stage the patrol game ends even if the other side does not have all of its markers locked down the game still ends. Now all of my markers are locked down Rich and I take it in turns to declare which one of our patrol markers we're going to convert into a jump off point to be used during the game. These jump off points represent the points on the table to which we know we can deploy our men rapidly and safely. We know that we own the ground up to that point, any closer to the enemy and we would need to move much more carefully. Richie's Germans had the first move with the patrol markers, so he will now select the first one that he wishes to convert to a jump off point. Of the four markers he used, only three will be converted in this way in this scenario. Once the game begins, I'll be able to deploy troops within six inches of my jump off points. I must place the jump off point at least six inches further away from the enemy than my patrol marker is and it must be in cover. Measure six inches from all the enemy patrol markers, not just the marker which locked my patrol marker down. So this marker in fact drops back about nine inches in total. 
We carry on placing our jump off points until we place three in total. For this scenario, that's the total number of jump off points available. They will vary for other scenarios. And now we can start the game proper. So that's the end of our pre-game patrol phase. We've determined exactly what our troops know about the ground and their limited and somewhat vague knowledge of the enemy's general position. Both sides know where no man's land is and that gap in between their two lines of jump off markers and now we're ready to start the game. These jump off markers will be important in the game to come so we'll take a look at that as we run through the game itself. For now, thanks for watching. I hope we'll see you in part two.